cancel the presentation. Instead, Professor Jordan has graciously accepted this uh, to give this presentation. He works on technology policy issues, including network neutrality, and I think the presentation has to do with that. Let's give him a more welcome. Okay, so this talk's going to be completely different than probably anything you've seen this year, in that I'm going to try to get you to think for at least a little bit of time, like this hour, and maybe a little bit in the rest of your life, about where the tech part that you're used to focusing on. If you're brave, you're welcome to sit up front. <laughs> um, so where that intersects with the stuff you usually don't think about, which is the legal part of it and the economic part of it. And it's not that I want to convince you to suddenly become a researcher in legal and economic stuff, but I want you to think about it and integrate it into the tech part that you're used to focusing on. So just to set up and you know, kind of make the point that I'll repeatedly make during the talk, we tend to have a view, at least while you're a researcher or in grad school, that is roughly like this. Right? You spend some period of time, a quarter, a year, whatever it is, trying to come up with a research idea. You spend several years doing it, and then you have this belief that if it's a good idea, and you work it out and publish it, that somebody in industry will build it. Right? And I'm going to argue that that's not right. Even worse, this is what the administrators here think. Um, they kind of recognize that there's something called research, but what they're often interested in is trying to make money off of it, and so they're worried about commercialization of this if it turns into money at the end. And I'm going to rant on that also as being inappropriate. So, um, for, I'm going to kind of go back and forth. Uh, I need to know first, because I'm going to jump around in this class. How many people in the room, your primary focus is something related to networking? How many people, your primary focus is something related to operating systems, um, Internet of Things, embedded systems? Okay, good. Um, this is networking focused, but then I'm going to come back and do some of the other parts of it. So we'll decide based on that. So I'm old enough and have enough gray hair or lack of hair to remember a lot of times in the last couple of decades. I'm in the networking field, so I remember the networking examples, but you'll have examples from your own fields for those people who know the things. Of things that we thought were great ideas, and we did all kinds of great research and published it, and then it didn't happen. So I will certainly talk about quality of service and prioritization, because that ties into net neutrality, and I'll give that as an example. Way back in the 80s and 90s, people did a whole bunch of great work about how do you broadcast over the internet and not have to individually stream to everybody. And it still doesn't exist on the internet, right? So that's weird. Um, we've gone through all kinds of waves of what's now turning into Internet of Things, and we've seen many previous generations of them, and somehow they don't happen. This time we think it's going to happen, but I want to learn from the past. And so there's all kinds of ideas where there's all kinds of great research that was done, but then something happened, and I want to focus on so what happened? Why did not they come out to be part of the internet or part of the world? Okay, so there's three examples that we can talk about. Um, this is from a previous version of the talk, and given the room, I think I'm going to change the order. I'm going to talk about Internet of Things first. I think I'll skip interconnection, which is about different network providers connecting together to form the whole internet, and then I think I want to do net neutrality based on the folks in the room. And then I think I will aim to end a little early in case people actually want to chat more about any of these. So forgive the, ah, okay. So um, in each of these, what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly talk about what the original vision was. I'm going to, in an absurdly short amount of time, comment on the research that was done, and then what went wrong. So that's the flavor of each of these. Okay, so way back when, i.e. for the grad students in the room, uh, just slightly before you were born, the view that we all had was that you should be able to build a network. We now just think of it as the internet. 
Um, folks will come up with all kinds of great devices. They'll come up with all kinds of great applications or apps. And they should all work together. So we had this notion of interoperability. So even way before internet access became ubiquitous, we had this idea of, well, there are these things that are ubiquitous of power plugs in the walls and phone plugs in the walls. And someday, gee, the internet will be like that. You'll be able to plug into the internet everywhere. Well, OK, you all know now it's become also wireless. And you're now used to the idea that Wi-Fi. So internet access is ubiquitous. You can now do things everywhere. You know, you're now doing it on your smartphone, wherever you are, as you're driving down, hopefully not you driving down the freeway. <laughs> but still, I want to now pick on the what does this mean? So what happened research-wise? What got developed? What didn't? Or the battery can die. Interesting. OK. Old-fashioned. Back to the old Batteries are not ubiquitous. <laughs> nope. I just put in a new set. So much for that. Oh, there we go. Back to life again. OK. So, so here's a... Anybody that's taken a networking course, from me, from Marco, from whoever, you've seen some version of what networking people live and die by, which is layers. And so TCP, IP, applications, stuff down toward the fiscal side. And the common thing that we as networking people always say is, there's only a few options here. There's tons of options down below, and it requires the wiring of type of wireless transmission. There's tons and tons and tons of applications. And this is the great thing about the internet, and so there's been all kinds of innovation up here and all kinds of innovation down there. And this was intentional. Right? The first lecture I think that we all give in these is modularity, is the power of modularity and the power of standardization is that folks can create applications without having to get permission from your internet service provider. And there's a similar story that Andrew would tell about innovation down below. Okay, so we did all kinds of great things. What did we not do? So um, I want to complain about all of my operating systems colleagues. I will make this a little harsher than it should be, but not too much. Um, in networking, we believed in modularity. Did you operating systems folks do this? Did you create some notion of an open operating system? And I think largely the answer is no. You've got a whole bunch of operating systems developed, great research, great development of them, and now what happens, you know, we're down to a couple of them, Windows, Linux, Android, right? But are they really modular? Are they really interoperable in the way that we did on the networking side? Um, security folks, do we have any security folks in the room? So is your authentication mechanisms, are those standardized? Are those interoperable? Not really. Somewhat not really. Um, is the signaling standardized? Well, it's IP it is, TCP it is, is it standardized for all the rest of this stuff between networks and operating systems, between networks and security systems, not so much. Okay, why do I care? The whole goal was we think that we want people to be able to create all kinds of devices. This is, again, we're back in the next version of it. This is the Internet of Things notion. There's going to be all these proliferation of devices, people to create Fitbits and medical devices and <coughs> thermometers and everything else, right? We had joked decades about, about refrigerators attached to the internet, now there are some. And it's even been ramped up. If you've been reading the media, they're now talking about 5G, the rest of the world beyond folks here have discovered it, and they think it's going to mean these wonderful things. And the assumption is everything's going to work with everything. You get this device from one folk, you get your internet connection, and everything's going to work together. And I want to ask that question of whether this will automatically happen. Well, there's some evidence against it. Um, Apple does great stuff. I like their phones. Um, I will note, this is not Apple's business model. Apple's business model is, to the extent possible, to drag you into the Apple universe, and that you should buy everything Apple. And they have a way of doing it, which is not making everything as interoperable as we thought it's supposed to be. Um, I could add a whole bunch more bullets these days if I wanted to update this. Everybody trying to sell you some kind of hub in the home. Uh, Amazon has a version. Google has a version. Are they doing it so that they're interoperable? Not really, right? 
We learned this lesson a long time ago. Before you were born, there were email systems where if you and I were going to send email to each other, we had to be on the same system. You think that's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. We solved it a long time ago. How did we solve it? We standardized the method of communication so that I can use my email program, you can use yours. Is that true for all kinds of messaging apps or social platforms, social networking apps, or this stuff? Is it going to be true for all your internet connected devices in the house? Not if these folks have their way, right? And again, add more people to it. Um, already talked about that. Okay, so examples. This is just one space that I played in. Um, you, the young folks in the room will hardly know what that is anymore. You probably still kind of recognize it, a DVR. <coughs> Question is, where do DVRs come from? Can you go to Best Buy or Amazon and buy the whatever DVR that has the features that you want and use it with the cable service that again, your young folks don't do, but your older parents do, probably still use? And the answer is no. That almost inevitably, um, they only come from whoever it is that provides the cable TV service. Why? Where did that come from? How did we wind up in that situation? That's not the vision that we had originally, that you go and you get all this great innovation in devices, and you go and you get your network hook up, and they just automatically work together. So what made that not work? And yeah, things are changing, right? Um, you, so you probably don't have a set-top box, but maybe you have a Roku. How many people have a Roku? Or no. Uh, how many people have um, some kind of little stick, like the Google version that you stick in and then throw its content? OK, that one you have. Um, does everything work with everything? Mm, not quite, right? So yeah, we're going from maybe a hardware version, the hardware is getting smaller, you have the stick version, to a software version. Um, how many people have ever used a Roku, just to pick on this? Okay, what you'll notice is, can you search across all the content from one single screen, the home screen, to the Roku? No, why? You've gotta go into each individual app, why? Lack of interoperability. Right? They've made behind the scenes deals with those folks who want to have a app on their system. Google's doing the same thing with their little sticks and anybody else with theirs would want. They're making individual deals. There's no interoperable standard that's going on. So I would say this is not the outcome that we intended. So where did we go wrong? How did we get to this? Um, and I'll pick on the two things I've picked on before. Did we think about the interfaces between security and networking? And the answer is not enough. Right? It's just natural from the research that these are done usually in two different kinds of groups. And there's some people, we don't have, I don't see Gene in the room, who tries to cross over from one to the other. But still, we don't really have the interfaces between them. And we're making the same mistake now with kind of the Internet of Things, I think. We're not thinking enough about the interface. Yeah, they know it's going to attach to the internet, it has to speak TCP IP, but are we really standardizing and making sure that our strings interoperable beyond that? Not really. We didn't think beyond our own piece of it. We thought about our own piece of it. We didn't think about how it would work with the rest of the world. I'm a networking guy, so a lot of this stuff, like TCP and IP, gets standardized by ITF. ITF, I don't think, is really in the game. I think they see their boundaries, and they don't want to go beyond those boundaries. And I'll pick on that again in the next part. And so it's those boundaries that are problematic. To the extent there's any kind of standardization done in the wider Internet of Things world, they're often not standards bodies like this. They're companies coming together and deciding who gets to be in the room and deciding between them on what's good for them. But they're not really thinking about necessarily what's good for the consumers. And we certainly, as technical people, really rarely think about the economics behind it. So we think, hey, if this is a good research idea, it's a good technical component, then it'll happen. Now, it's only going to happen if the people who need to make it happen see a business case out of it. And we'll come back to that in the net neutrality piece also. Oh, and we don't think ever about the legal piece. 
So I'll go back to the original picture I had with the telephone plug, wherever they are in this room. Um, why is it I can go and buy a phone and I don't have to get it from the phone company and I can plug it in and it's going to work? And yet I can't do the same thing with the set-top box, with the DVR. So what's the difference? Anybody have an idea? I don't expect you to know the answer, but it should seem weird to you. And the answer is, this is not the first time we've hit this issue. We've hit this issue many times before. So with the phone example, you've got to go even farther back, so this is definitely before you were born. Um, there was a time when, only a few of us in the room are going to remember this, there was no modular plug. It was wired into the wall, and you had to get your phone from the phone company. And the phone company said, it would be the end of the world as we know it. Right? It will break our network, is what they said. If you're allowed to go to, you know, today, Best Buy or Amazon or wherever and get a phone from somebody other than us, it's not going to work with our network. It's going to not signal correctly. It's going to interfere. It's going to harm our network. And it took the courts to jump in and the government to jump in and say, no, this is not reasonable. And starting, oh, about 50 years ago, almost exactly now, you have a right. And so they had to go to a modular interoperable system. This thing comes up again and again and again. Companies are interested often in trying to lock you in. It's a matter of do you have a right to be able to have competition? Or do they have a right to lock you into their ecosystem or their world? And so again, it's not like you're going to do work in this, but I want you, as you're doing your research, to think about and talk to folks, potentially, who are in other areas. Because there's really interesting things that go on at these intersections. Okay, so if you're in the IoT space, right, mainly you're going to do the technical, but I would encourage you to at least think about what are the rights? What's the rights of the consumer? What's the rights of the folks who are making the IoT device? What's the right of the content provider? Where did they come together? And have you all thought about the interfaces that are going to allow them to come together? And have you thought about whether those are going to be standardized or not? Because these are the things that's going to provide very different paths to potential deployment and very different outcomes into what really gets offered in the world and what doesn't. Uh, I think that's the end of that part of the talk. I'm about to switch to net neutrality. I'm going to do maybe discussion in parts. Any questions, discussion about this part of it? So I know some of you work in this space. Oh, people are too nervous. <laughs> okay. Let's do, I'm going to flip over doing this in a different order than it was intended. I'm going to do the net neutrality part of it. Okay. So, if anybody's ever had the misfortune of having a network request from me, you've seen this slide. Um, I've had some version of this slide for 30 years now. Not everything in our space moves so quickly that everything is brand new every two or three years. <coughs> and what I teach folks is, um, here's what the telephone network looks like, here's how it was designed, here's why. And then, Next one, long time ago, right? And then cable TV networks got developed for cable video. And here's what they look like and why. And then, so that's like 1980s, 1990s. Here's when, how cell phone, net, here's what cell phone service looks like. Here's how the networks look like. Here's why. And then, here's internet protocol. Here's what it looks like. Here's why. And then the point I always make is these things, you know this. Your generation knows this. This is all coming together, and we are now using, you're using your smartphones to do the same thing you're using internet for. Um, for the young folks in the room, you barely remember what these are, but behind the scenes, these all run over the same network, and within probably the next five or ten years, that won't really be separate anymore from everything else. It's going to merge in, um, although there's always going to be some differences in the pieces of the network. Okay, so our vision for a long time was, I knew the, we knew these things were merging. 
30 years ago we knew these were merging. It's been slow to happen. We're getting that. Okay, what does that mean? So one of the things it means is if we think about the different applications that were on the last slide, um, telephone networks were designed, not surprisingly, for phone calls. And if you've ever taken a networking course from any of us, we told you the acceptable delay between when I speak and when you hear me, if we're doing a telephone call, is a few tenths of a second max. After that, your perceived quality drops off the cliff. Um, and then we tell you the internet, unlike what it's being used for now, was really designed for email and file transfer. And the acceptable delay from when I send an email until you receive it is what? What do you think is okay? 24 hours. No. <laughs> right? But most folks would say, okay, your expectation is 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, right? It's not a few tenths of a second. And stuff in between. Uh, acceptable delay from when you punch in a URL until you get the full web page. How long? Zero. Five, ten seconds? Yeah, they've done user studies. Usually, there's a variation, but usually in the three to five second range, depends on how badly you want the web page. <laughs> acceptable delay from when you hit play for an internet video until the video starts playing. Again, something like three seconds-ish, right? This is very different, 30 seconds or a minute, from a few tenths of a second. Um, so what? So we designed the internet for packet switching based on that. We designed the phone network for circuit switching based on that. How do you do a network that does all of these? And so, you know, we knew this problem 30 years ago. Um, we did a bunch of research um, just to make it really embarrassing. Where's the picture? Oh, no, I took it out. So this is from my thesis, God knows how long ago, right? So we talked about, you know, if we're going to do computers, we're going to do internet and phone and they're going to merge, we've got to figure out how to take bursty traffic and more steady traffic and be able to put them together and what's the trade-off going to be between these and how do we allocate resources to voice versus allocate resources to video or data. And there was a whole bunch of people that did a bunch of great research for several decades. And we characterized what these network flows look like, and we talked about how to characterize acceptable delay, like we just talked about here, and how do we build scheduling policies and the routers for the different kinds of traffic, and how do we make all this thing work. And so some of us were even sane enough to start bringing in notions of economics, because we realized the only way to make it all work is to associate a price. So that's all good news. Um, other folks worked on like the queuing stuff to make the routers work and be able to take this traffic and figure out how to schedule it all. Uh, I think this was because I was giving a talk at Columbia with this guy who had been doing this for a long time. So this was all great. A bunch of great papers. We assumed it would happen. Oh, yeah, that's what I looked like back then. Um, and so we even talked about trying to bring in economics in order to figure out how to manage the conversation between your laptop or smartphone and the network and so that your application gets the resources you need. And if those folks who play in the economics fields, this will look vaguely familiar, we brought in some notion of utility and how to communicate stuff back and forth. Okay, so great. Um, what happened? We published the papers, we put it out there, we assumed uh, it would show up in the internet. Well, it's the standardization part, because at least in networking, we know things have to become standards. So this got thrown off to ITF to create the standards. ITF did create some. If you've done Marco, do you talk about inserve and diffserve? If you're talking Marco's networking class, right? So then ITF did standardize part of it. They said, okay, instead of traffic coming into the router and its best effort first come, first serve, Maybe we're going to have to do something different because some of it's voice and needs to get through in fractions of a second, and some of it's email and it's not as much of a hurry, and maybe we can tag them somehow as email versus voice, and we can serve them differently, and some will get through faster than others. And they waited, and it didn't show up in the internet. And they said, okay, maybe we had a problem with the way we did it. We're going to do a new version. And there's a second version, 
And at the level we're talking about here, I'm not going to worry about the difference between the two. They took a second crack at it. And again, they did this. But they only focused on the technical stuff. They focused on how do you label packets. They didn't so much think about who's going to determine the priority. The vision we had, I believe, was the user of the application would decide. We'll come back to that in a minute. But they worked out stuff about, you know, here's different ways you can do the scheduling in the router. Um, and then they tossed it off to industry. And so Cisco was building a lot of the routers at the time. And so Cisco said, well, the ITF gave us these standards, but they didn't specify how to map it to the different kinds of traffic. Nobody standardized this. We're going to do it. And so Cisco did it, and they said, OK, if it's voice, it gets this priority level. And if it's video streaming, it gets that priority level. And if it's you know, email, it gets that. And if it's your peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, well, hell, that can wait. Right? But this isn't standardized. This is just Cisco. Right? So it depends on whose equipment you buy and how much influence they have. What didn't happen? We wrote all kinds of great papers on here's different ways to do scheduling. This is the stuff we like to do. Um, we never standardized it. We said, well, it's up to Cisco what they build in. And it's up to Comcast as to what they put in their network and how they use it. Um, we never even standardized the priority levels. Cisco did it on that last slide. But that's not really a standard. That's just what they say. So we have lack of interoperability here. We have lack of standardization there. Um, we never even worked out all the signaling, which is surely what we're supposed to know how to do. But the standardization body was worried about being too specific about what internet providers and network providers have to do. They are companies. They have their own goal in life, which is to make money. And they have to make the decision of how they're going to deploy and fine tune what they're going to offer. And so they said, well, we'll just give them options, but it's up to them how to do it. And we never certainly worked out any of the economic pieces. We're technical people. We don't do economics. ITF stops at that boundary and doesn't want to say anything about money or law. <coughs> Definitely don't want to say anything about law. Right? It's up to the ISPs to do what they want to do. OK, so given that, what do you think happened? Well, we had all these great ideas. There's research if we put it all out there. Surely it'll become part of the internet. But given that we didn't do any of this stuff, the question is, is what happened? From the researcher point of view, they said, we did all this great stuff in the 1980s and 1990s, and by the 2000s, we don't see it. It's not happening. We give up. And a lot of people still believe that it never came to be. They're wrong. It came to be, but it came to be in a different way than we envisioned it. So the cable companies initially offered cable TV video. Then by this time, they started getting into offering broadband internet. Right? We went from dial-up, AOL days, to always-on broadband connections. And then they started trying to sell telephone service, compete against the telephone company, We're doing the US version. Um, how did they offer wireline phone service? Did they do it the way the telephone company did? Now, the telephone company did it circuit switching. They didn't want to have to build a separate circuit switch infrastructure. Um, by now, we know how to do voice over IP. So they run their telephone service over IP. In fact, they run it over the same bandwidth that your internet connection goes over. And so how is it um, that it sounds really good? And the answer is, guess what? They prioritize those packets. If you use, how many of you use Skype? You can go in to your Skype app and have it mark your Skype packets as high priority. What happens when those packets hit your ISP? What happens when they get to Cox or Comcast or AT&T? 
They decide. What's that? They decide. What do they decide? So if you're AT&T or Comcast, uh, I'm your customer, what are you going to do when I hand you a Skype packet and say, much please treat this as my priority? Yeah, you're going to say, uh, what am I going to get out of this? Right? What are you going to pay me? Right now, they're not offering you a package where you can pay for this. So given that they're not offering it, they just remarket as best effort. So you have this difference where um, they're giving priority to their own voice packets, but not to competing folks like Skype. <coughs> and the, the, tel the telephone companies are doing the same thing. It's just in a different order. They offered a telephone service from way back when, and then they started offering DSL-based internet. And now a lot of them are trying to offer what looks like cable TV. Again, they didn't do it the way it was originally done. Circuit switch, they're doing it more of a packet switch way. How is it that it works well? How is it that it's better quality than the video you get over the internet? And the answer is they prioritize. But will they prioritize YouTube for you, or will they prioritize Netflix for you? No, why should they? Right? What are they getting out of it? And we're seeing the same problem with cell phones. OK. So this is not what we thought would happen. We thought, hey, We've done these great things, it'll happen in the internet, and you'll be able to use it for everything. You'll be able to do it for whatever you want. Voice, video, how many people in here are gamers? Okay, gaming needs even lower delay. Um, but, again, you don't really get to choose. You can't go and tell your ISP, they're not offering you a gaming package yet. Maybe someday. Scott? Yeah. Uh, going back to Skype for a second. So when Skype first came out, they advertised themselves as internet telephony that just worked, and it did. It worked really well. And then Microsoft took over and seemed to go to pot. I mean, I mean I, I, I'm a fan of slagging on Microsoft. Um, but I wonder, is, is it possible that back then, the internet providers didn't lower the priority of packets, and the priority packets, so the packets were actually going through as high priority? Yeah, they've, they've always done it only within their own networks and for their own stuff, unless you're a business customer, in which case there may be a different product for you. Okay, so I can still blame Microsoft for the fact that Skype now sucks. Now, I would argue we can have a disagreement over it. I think Skype never had the same performance that you expect from your wireline service, even from your cell phone service, which has other problems. Um, the issue is Skype initially started as a low-end service. Right, so they got in by offering a free product and then trying to get you to upgrade to a higher product. This is very common. But their higher product wasn't higher quality, it was the ability to be able to call a telephone number or get calls from a regular phone rather than having the internet to internet. That they haven't gotten to that next step yet. Microsoft's still trying to figure that out. Oh, when it went from voice to video, and similarly, right, there's the free version, and then there usually is a premium version, offers additional features. They still haven't solved the performance issue, because they haven't gotten past this. Okay, so here's the bad news. Oh, and then, guess what? You know, we never thought anybody in politics paid attention to any of this. Right, this is technology, this is internet. Um, this is 2006. Um, folks in Congress are trying to update laws that have to do with telephone networks and cable TV. Right? Internet's still just barely not something that they've written law for yet. You have a whole bunch of law that has to do with wireline phone, and a bunch of law that has to do with cell phone, and a bunch of law that has to do with cable TV. They've never gotten around to writing law for internet, um, and somebody brings up this issue about prioritization. And it becomes a big political issue. If I was giving this talk 10 years ago, I'd get a bunch of blank looks. You all heard of net neutrality, so I don't have to explain it in too much detail. So here's ads from folks you know, on the pro side, and here's ads from folks on the negative side. Um, regulate, don't regulate. Um, these are aimed at folks in Congress to try to get them to vote one way or the other. And it's become a problem and a political ever issue ever since. And we can talk more about it if folks want to. Um, and so this is not where we thought we'd wind up when we started doing the research. Okay, lessons learned. What went wrong? 
We did all this great research, but we stopped at this boundary that we usually stop at. IETF stops at this boundary all the time. We don't want to talk about the economics behind it. We just want to talk about the technical side, and we'll throw it out to the world, and they'll, it'll happen. Um, we didn't standardize even these priority levels. So if you talk to the cable companies, you talk to, if you talk to your internet, internet service providers, and you say, well, why do you use prioritization inside your network, but you remark to best effort when it goes out? And you know, AT&T will say, well, we don't trust Comcast to do the right thing. And Comcast will say, we don't trust AT&T. It's the wild jungle out there. I'm like, I've heard from both of you. You both are saying the same thing. This is crazy, right? Our fault. We didn't do this. We really should have done some kind of coordination mechanisms. We viewed this as working across the internet. We never worked out the signaling and the messaging and the economics to allow the messages and the economics, the money, to flow from one end to another. We ducked that because we didn't think it was our job. Um, and all of that, I argue, in part, neutrality is a big debate, but I think it's part of what caused this, is it allowed for companies to use it just for themselves and not do it end to end, not offer it to the rest of the world. And at some level, that kind of sounds like the telephone company saying you have to get your phones from us. Or other folks these days saying, you know, this system only works if you buy our stuff. It's a similar kind of concept. It's not rare. This happens all the time. And we certainly didn't think about the legal. So where does that come in? So I'll go back to ancient history again, because this is history repeating itself. Um, Way back when, right, when phone services got developed, there was a question about, did the phone companies just get to do whatever they want to do? Or does the government put some constraint on them? And there were two things that were recognized. Um, one is that it's really expensive to build out network infrastructure. It's really expensive, whether it's wires to dig up and put the wires in, or string them, or if it's wireless, that's a lot of money these days to buy spectrum. And so you don't expect that you're going to get 10 competitors who are all offering you internet access. It's not going to happen. It's too expensive for each of them to do that, and they're splitting a fixed number of possible subscribers. And there's only a few of them that are able to recoup their costs. So if you go take a basic economics course, they'll say, this is a market failure. Don't expect the free market to solve the issue for you. There are people who say it will. It's not true. And the other part is, if I ask you when you signed up for a cell phone service, back in the days when you remembered that these things could make phone calls and not just used to access the internet or texting, what do you expect? What are you buying? What are you paying your service provider for? Um, what's the service that you think that they're providing to you? What does it mean to get telephone service? And so I think what your answer would be, well, their job is to connect you to the person you're talking to and get your voice signal to them and get their voice signal to you. And you don't expect them to listen in and monetize it or mock with the signal um, between source and destination. OK, same question. Internet service. What do you think you pay your ISP for? What's their job? What do you pay them for, those of you who are paying a monthly bill? What's the service? Data speed. What's that? Data speed. You're paying them to do something at a certain speed. To do what at that speed? Transfer packets. Transfer packets from you to wherever you want them to go and get that web page or whatever you want back to you. And I would argue, and you don't pay them, you don't expect them to muck with it. It's not a legal term, but. You don't expect to muck with it between any point A and point B. Well, this had never been spelled out by Congress. And so, do we have another slide on this? Um, oh, let's see. Now, yeah, let me just continue to talk about that for a minute. Um, and so now there's been different claims. So in 2015, the Federal Communications Commission looked at it and said, internet service is in that sense similar to telephone service. Oh, and Guess what? Um, 80 years ago, Congress said, because that's the characteristic of the service, your telephone company 
cannot muck with the traffic, your voice signal in between point A and point B. Um, you can't unreasonably discriminate. And so, late 2015, the FCC said, same thing for internet. That internet has the same characteristics, is therefore subject to the same thing. They can't block, they can't throttle, they can't, in some sense, unreasonably discriminate. Um, as of December of 2017, there's just been a reversal. The new FCC has just now said, no, it's not what you're paying for. You're actually paying for them to muck with the traffic. You may not think that, but that's what they've said. And the rules go away because of that. Right? Okay. So, what does this mean? Um, we did not, in the research side, think about will an ISP choose to do this great thing that we just developed the technical means to do. We said, hey, we've done this great research, it'll happen. We didn't think about will they choose to do it. We should have. We didn't think about payment. Who's going to pay who? What's the case for this? Why are they going to bother to deploy it? Um, we certainly viewed that it would be the user of the application that gets to decide. Um, if you ask the ISP who gets to decide, what do you think their answer is going to be? They'd like to be the one to decide. We're going to look at your traffic and think about whether or not, if you're happy with that, great. I'm not. And we didn't think about the coordination mechanism. We assumed it would happen. We should have worked it out. We didn't work it out. Okay. Um, I'm not going to do the last one. I'm going to open it up for discussion or questions. So, any thoughts, questions, comments? Yeah. So, uh, I was involved in building that uh, network from 1990s. So, I'm so well aware of all that. So, the biggest issue is uh, they weren't, uh, when they tried to uh, remove uh, uh, policies that prevented uh, telecommunication companies from merging with each other, they started merging uh, and building one big company, which basically back to uh, mobile. And that company uh, uh, had tried to get rid of all the independent ISPs that they could. In the 1990s, there were hundreds, uh, thousands of small independent ISPs, so providing mm -hmm. dial-up service and some trying to do the uh, uh, DSL. So what happened is, uh, it's very hard to actually provide you on uh, wire to somebody. So they had to buy wire from the telephone companies. Uh, telephone companies uh, allowed to do that if they paid uh, for putting the equipment uh, in the in, in the uh, basically buildings in the in the. But they were charging huge amounts of money for that. Uh, in addition to that, uh, they were providing the DSL service themselves at extremely low price compared to the price they were trying to get for the actual uh, DSL line. Yeah, so so that, 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 that more or less got rid of all the, there were at least uh, four different attempts at building uh, large uh, DSL providers in addition to, to the local telcos like uh, Southwestern Bell at the time. Remember Megapass, like Covert was it? There were at least, uh, at least three, uh, three large ones and several smaller ones. All of them failed. Because, because of the way the telephone companies uh, who actually owned all the infrastructure tried to price it uh, for them in order, in order to uh, basically get rid of them. Yeah, so, so let me extract a piece out of that, just yeah. to translate it for the folks. Great comments, but let me translate a piece of it. Um, when the architecture, let me bring it back to architecture and then make the connection again. When the architecture was dial-up, right back in the AOL days, when it was dial-up internet, it's a very, let's go back to the layer picture. It's a very different notion. What's at the bottom layers is the telephone network and the internet connections writing over it. The expensive part's down here. That's already been done by the telephone company. It's relatively cheap in those days to become an ISP. You just had to provide the dial-up part. You did the packet switching over the circuit switching, but the expensive part's down here. So you got thousands of ISPs, dial-up ISPs, offering service in the US. When you have thousands, then the base economics course will say, free market will work, competition will work. They'll do the right thing, because you'll go to whoever is doing what you want to do. You can express your opinion. When we went from dial-up to broadband, guess what happened? It's not that you had the telephone company and then somebody like AOL on top. Now who can you buy internet from? What's your choices? From your home or apartment? 
you want to buy wired internet, who do you get to get it from? Comcast or Charter? What's that? Comcast or Charter? That's basically your cable it. company. Because they already have a wire into your house to offer cable TV, and then they start offering internet broadband. Or your telephone company. And one of each. You have at most two choices. And maybe one of them is not high enough speed to make you happy, so maybe you have one choice. Or if you live in a real rural area, you might have zero choices at the speed you consider acceptable. So now standard economics would say um, competition's not going to do it. We have no reason to expect that it will provide the socially beneficial outcome. And if you're taking a policy course, then the standard thing we would teach is this is now a reason for government to step in and do something, is to act in the public interest. But in order to do that, we need people who understand the technical side, who understand the economic side, and who understand the legal side. And that's weird people like me. I'm not trying to convince you to do this. But um, there has to be some intersection so those folks understand and can say, OK, we are now in this point we're debating. Is internet like telephone or not in the sense of what you're paying for the service? Is it you're paying to get packs to one side or the other? Or are you paying them to create some kind of more closed garden in which they're offering you not just transport of the packets, but they're also offering you, well, now content, back to mergers, right? And they're offering you security, and they're offering you email, and they're offering you ability to host a web page, right? So which view of it is it? And that's what's changed things. More comments, more questions. One, two. So um, as things move more into like the economic and legal domain, yeah. what do you feel is your agency or maybe loss of agency as a, as a, as a researcher who um, sort of you know, built the foundation upon which you had this technology that was more or less passed off to businesses? Like what, what is your actual agency as a researcher in this, uh, like today, now, at this stage? Yeah. So wide range, right? If you're not inclined to go too far in, you want to stay almost all technical, at least think about interfaces and standardization make it at least easier and possible to have the vision carried out the way you want to carry it out. You're still not guaranteed it's going to happen that way, but at least do what you can to make it possible. If you're inclined to go a little bit further, spend a little bit of your time talking to folks that look at this from a different point of view. Talk about to folks who look at it from the economic point of view, or the legal point of view, or even the informatics point of view. Right? Um, if you want to go farther, and learn enough about what they do to have a productive conversation and to be able to start influencing it. Right. We're getting, you know, we went from, I think, almost 100% of you down to a few percent. But, you know, there's a spectrum of options. Maybe following on from that, um, when should we be talking to the economists and when should we be talking to the lawyers? Uh, the, the thing I'm thinking about, I'm a visitor from Europe, and there you, you'll be familiar with GDPR, uh, mm -hmm. regulating personal data. Yep. One of the interesting parts of that has been this data portability, where they've said, we really want data to be extractable in standardized machine-readable formats, which is kind of an acknowledgement that economics argument isn't working there, and that the law really had to step in. So are there examples where users are actually going to pay for having QoS, or having privacy, or having this flexibility and interoperability. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll, uh, let me just kind of do a longer, let me expand the scope of the question, because GDRPR is great. How many of you have been getting a whole rash of emails this last week or two, updating privacy policies, maybe asking your permission, maybe not? It's because of what he's talking about. Europe's ahead of us and just implemented a new law, and companies are reacting to it. OK, so what happens in the privacy space? Um, so I'll give one point of view. There'll be lots of people that will disagree. So one point of view is when you sign up for a service, whether it's your ISP and getting internet access, or Facebook and doing whatever they do, um, you have an expectation, I would argue, that there's certain of your information that they may look at, they may collect, they may use, but your expectation is going to use it for the service that you signed up for. I expect my ISP certainly to look at the IP header, see what the IP address of the packet that I put it into their system, and get it where it needs to go. They can't do it otherwise. I don't expect them to make a list of websites that I've gone to and sell that 
or make money off of it some way. So there's this one distinction. And there maybe there's another distinction of how sensitive am I to how it's being used. So still just from the consumer point of view, as technologists, what can we contribute to that? We can help those people understand where those lines are. Because there's all kinds of claims being made by different businesses as to what you agreed to when you signed up for the service. And it was all embedded in that fine print. And that's one issue. Some folks have both the legal version of the privacy policy. Some folks are really good and have a user understandable version. Some folks don't. So there's that issue. Then there's the issue of where do you draw the line? What did you consent to when you signed up? What should you be able to consent to or not? That's kind of beyond that. Then there's an the economic piece. OK, if you don't want to consent to having your information used for, let's say, behavioral advertising, should there be a charge for that? Or I could do it the other way. Should they be able to give you a discount if you agree to it? And there's different opinions on that. In order to really attack that, you've got to understand both the technical and the economic. And then there's the legal piece of how do we decide now when the free market will do it and when the government has to jump in. And you need to talk to legal folks if you want to solve that one. I'm happy to talk more about it offline. I've worked in the privacy space, both federal and state. Oh, we have some interesting stuff going on at the state level. Some folks are trying to get bills through to be able to do some of giving you more control over when you get to make those decisions. Um, not quite the full GDPR thing, but picking up pieces of that. And also, there'll be something on the ballot, for those who get to vote, um, there'll be some stuff on the ballot in November. There'll be at least one initiative that has to do with this. So this is a very active debate in the US right now also. Yeah? <coughs> is there a technical side to this? In other words, can someone argue that the POS mechanisms the researchers came up with were too complicated? For example, RSVP took years to develop, and at the end, it was deemed to be unscalable. Yeah, so it's both. I think it's. Um, I think that we did get to the point of simplifying it enough that it could be implemented. It took us a long time. I think we didn't do the interoperability, we didn't do the standardization. <laughs> Same thing on the privacy, since I'm going to privacy. So I just got off a phone call, the reason I hurried in here at the last moment, of a whole bunch of people arguing over um, claims in the privacy space. If you do read those privacy policies, which most of you don't, you will find that the business often claims that data has been de-identified or anonymous. And there's a whole question about can that be done? How can that be done? On the technical side, folks tend to work on algorithms to be able to anonymize or de-identify. Great, great work. Um, now think about how it's going to be used in the real world and pair it back to the economic and legal. So there's more work to be done on the technical, but there's a lot of work to be done on connecting it. Right? Um, there's no agreement that even the academic community is communicating to the rest of the world at a time when it's critical when things like GDPR or the privacy laws are being done. Is, does this category of information exist? Is it true that there's valuable information that can be de-identified or anonymized and that can't be reversed? Why don't we know? Why don't we agree? That's a problem. Last comments or questions? Yeah. yeah, I don't know if you mentioned it. I mean, uh, the, the QoS was supposed to be easily uh, transmittable be, uh, between ISPs by with IPv6, which has never really happened uh, in the way that uh, researchers and uh, early adopters were hoping. Uh, we, actually, put, we put the bits in the header. Yes. We, we made it possible. They can, those bits can be put in there. They can go from one ISP to another. We solved that problem. We didn't solve the issues of what's the incentive to do it. We didn't route the money, we routed the packets. We didn't standardize the meaning of what's in the header. We didn't think about do they have to pay attention to it. It's all that other stuff. We got the bits in the header. Uh, it's easier to do it without IPv4, a lot easier. ISPs would tend not to do it when they appear with each other. And there is a technical issues about why. Last comments or questions?
Okay, you're free to go. I'll stick around for a couple of minutes if people were too shy to ask them in front of the whole room. Let's thank Professor.